Welcome back to the last session of uh, today with the speakers. Um, we decided that a really good way to promote interaction and new ideas and new insights was to get um, four diverse voices who represent different points of view, different sectors, but are all really intelligent and insightful and are going to have really high level things to say <laughs> about, this, um, about this conference and about the illegal wildlife trade in general to come and um, give us their perspectives. And those perspectives are based upon their own experience, what they've heard today, what they haven't heard today, what they think they should have heard today. And um, so with that introduction, which I'm sure they're really thrilled about, um, I'm going to just ask them in turn to uh, introduce themselves and then say a little bit about where they come from in their perspective and then talk about some of the points that have interested them. And hopefully we'll get different things so that Ming at the end has got um, something to say that other people haven't already said. So I'll just, I'll just introduce quickly, it's, we've got Naomi Doak from the Royal Foundation, we've got Rosalind Duffy from the University of Sheffield, we've got Bob Smith from the University of Kent, and we've got Chin Min Lee, but I can't pronounce your university. Sun Yat Sen. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, thank you very much all four of you for taking on this challenge. And uh, we'll start with Naomi. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks, EJ. Um, I told her to start at the other end. And I also feel a little bit like I might be an imposter up here now after that introduction. Um, very briefly, my name is Naomi Doak, and as EJ uh, introduced very early on, I'm from an organisation called the Royal Foundation, and I currently oversee their conservation work, including an attempt at, at um, large-scale collaboration, which is called United for Wildlife. So I'm here sort of under mixed guises. I'm here tomorrow to, to join in one of the panels to talk about the work we do in the business sector. Um, I, I scribbled down before from EJ's email, inter the things that I found interesting, inspired, intrigued, irritate or irritated me. Um, when I came to the project launch, I, a lot of you may have, have been at that launch, and I said at the time that my main role these days is, is as a bit of a disruptor. Um, I tend to stick my hand up and, and try and ask difficult questions and try and, um, I guess, in a way, link what I know and what I've learnt about behaviour change, a, a lot of a bit of which we heard about today, and turn that mirror onto the conservation sector. And, and so I'm actually going to start at the bottom of the list <laughs> of, of points that, that EJ passed on. And I think um, one of the things that jumped out at me that not irritated me but surprised me was that we did hear a lot about changing the behaviour of consumers. We even heard about poachers and traffickers. Um, we didn't hear a lot about changing behaviour. We heard great insights on amazing projects that I think have created a really strong platform for the discussions for the next two days. I'm hopeful that in those next two days we do kind of try and refocus it back down onto changing demand. Um, as a classically trained scientist, when I see that in the title, that, that's what I'm all geared up for and I'm hoping that the next two days we can really narrow in on that. But I'm a little bit irritated because I think we have failed to recognise that we do actually need to change the behaviour of the conservation sector. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about everybody else, but, but very free, infrequently do we turn that mirror back on us. Um, I, I don't think... We're not winning. <laughs> Illegal wildlife trade, we're not winning, whether you consider it um, elephants and rhinos. Yes, I'd call them charismatic. Um, I, I checked the definition of charismatic when I was sitting here at lunchtime. It's any species that appeals to popular um, belief and in some way attracts the public to your cause. And so I do think, as a biologist, every species that we work on and is affected by illegal wildlife trade is charismatic. So I think, you know, we need to just accept and, and stop pigeonholing two or three animals into that category and recognise that they are all animal or plant, Nastya, they're all charismatic. <laughs> And they all need our help, and we're not doing enough. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm hoping the next two days we can start thinking about that and thinking about how we need to change our behaviour. 
I, I know, you know, the, the, this project in particular is also about improving the way we work together, linking NGO experience on the ground with academic research, with private sector. And we heard, at least I heard a lot today from each, from two of those, academic and NGO research, all doing amazing work. But not in one of those presentations did I hear someone say, I worked with academia or as an academic researcher, I worked with NGOs. Not just to conduct the research on the ground, but to design it. Because there are such valuable lessons that we can all be learning from everybody in this room and beyond. <laughs> I don't want to restrict it just to here. So I think, you know, all of those, that sort of brief add-on to my introduction sort of covered all of those things I was asked to talk about. It interested me why we're not doing that yet. It gave me hope that we, through this project, through this kind of symposium, we might be getting there and, and starting to think about it. I think we've got a long way to go. We need to think about how we do that, not just coming together to share lessons learned and research, but to actually do it from the beginning and do it so much better than how we are now. Because I still see two very separate um, entities all working for the same goal. And then, as, as uh, as was mentioned in the last presentation in the lead up to what I, I definitely hope is a fairly significant event, how we bring other sectors into that conversation, the private sector, you know, more than just academic, more than just changing behaviour, but linking it all to criminal networks and, and really doing our best at fighting this challenge. So those things, they inter it interested me, it inspired me, it intrigued me and it irritated me all at the same time. I'm hoping... <laughs> that you all felt, some of you all felt those, at least one or two of those reactions, otherwise maybe I'm in the, maybe I should have been in the ethnobiology, whatever it was, conference, um, because maybe I was in the wrong place. But, uh, but I'm hoping, you know, if we're all in that same place that I just described, we can try and find a way to, to do it a bit better, because we, we still are failing <laughs> miserably, whether it's elephants and rhinos or little blue geckos, which I just tend to think are more charismatic. Um, thanks, um, and thanks very much for the invitation to um, speak at the end of the day. So, um, I'm Rosine Duffy, and I'm a Professor of International Politics at the University of Sheffield. Um, and at the moment, I run a large European Research Council grant on the illegal wildlife trade, and what we're looking at is the different ways that biodiversity conservation and global security are becoming increasingly integrated, and what kinds of conservation that drives, and also possibly what kinds of security um, that drives. And two of the members of the research team are sat up at the back, Laura Joani and uh, Hannah Dickinson, who uh, you'll see about in the conference as well. But we have two more people um, joining us as well, um, Francis Massey and Jared Margulies. And we'll be working on ca uh, the caviar trade, on green surveillance technologies, um, on uh, rhino poaching and elephant poaching in South Africa and on IUU fishing. Um, so... Um, the, 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 so the project's really at the beginning stage, and um, I've brought along some of our Natty branded flyers, um, if anyone wants to pick one up um, later on. But what I'm going to focus on is um, the points of um, the sort of political context of our discussions today. And I wanted to focus on the areas that were perhaps implicit, but might need to be made explicit, and also the areas that have been rendered invisible in our discussions um, today. So I think any meeting of this kind, or any meeting of any kind, is on the one hand defined by who is here, um, but it's also defined by who is not here, which voices are heard and which voices are not heard. Um, and I think it's useful for us all to take some time to reflect back on what we're all doing here, why we're here, um, and what we... Uh, uh, and how we do, how we conduct our research, or how we conduct our uh, policy implementation. Um, and I think so, certainly one of the first things I, I'd want to say is, is that education works both ways. Very often in feedback and talks that I give about the research that I do, um, one of the comments I get is, "Well, we, you know, we just need to teach local communities or educate local communities about the value of species." And my question there is, is what does that education mean? Why do we think as conservationists that local communities need educating? What can we learn from local communities? What can we learn from uh, all, lots of different places around the world? So education is kind of a two-way street. It's not really just about conservationists or conservation researchers teaching everybody else how it should be done. Um, 
The second thing I think is about, uh, around categorisations, and this is something that's been implicit through the day. There's been a, a sort of categorisations of groups of people, so women as one group, men as one group, the Chinese as one group. Um, and I think, you know, it's useful to think about what do these categorisations really mean? Who are the poor? And in the illegal wildlife trade, is it absolute poverty or relative poverty that matters? Yeah, you know, what does poverty mean? Who are the poor? Who are consumers? Um, and that we need to be a little bit more nuanced about the different groups of people we talk about, rather than, in social science language terms, essentialising them into one single category. I should say there that I'm a trained social scientist and international politics is my background, um, so I'll apologise for any use of uh, jargon from, uh, from social sciences, but those sorts of essentialising characteristics, of sort of essentialising whole groups of people as one singular thing is often not very helpful, so I think we need to be very nuanced in the way that we talk about conservation. And within that, I think one of the things that we overlook at our peril is the politics of race. Um, which is there implicit in some of the discussions, but is not made explicit. And certainly, a lot of the work that I've done is around um, uh, uh, poaching in sub-Saharan Africa, and the sort of lack of engagement with, or lack of understanding of the sort of colonial history of Africa and how it pl plays into illegal wildlife hunting now um, is one of the real barriers for conservation. Um, and so I think it's really important that we address the politics of race and we don't uh, run away from it. Um, I also think there's been a lot of kind of uh, the, the languages around the spectacular and the charismatic, what's most endangered, most threatened, most valuable. Um, but we've been reminded a lot today that actually the illegal wildlife trade is the everyday, the mundane, the not very charismatic, although I don't know what you said about everything should be charismatic. Um, and uh, we've also focused on, you know, things that are already dead or parts of animals, but the pet trade, for instance, hasn't been addressed um, quite as squarely as we might have um, today. Um, and a sort of a, a further reflection was on uh, methods. Um, and again, I think we need to think as conservationists about the imagery we use. Does the imagery we use in our PowerPoints contribute to the problem? Does it deepen a sort of sense of crisis? Um, does it deepen any kind of racial politics around, uh, um, uh, around conservation? Uh, there weren't any examples of it today, but some of the worst examples I've seen are of you know, lots of um, very sort of muscly, burly, white military trainers with 10 or 15 African men doing press-ups in front of them, which feeds into colonial stereotyping and the sort of racial politics that I said we need to uh, address. So we need to understand how we frame questions, how we present ourselves and our own normative positions. And, and I don't imagine that as a social scientist I can immediately walk into any lab and start doing kind of uh, natural science type uh, work very effectively. And equally, I encourage you to think of if you want to engage in social science methods, and I'd encourage everyone to come on in, we're very welcoming, but that it's a whole canon on its own with its own way of thinking about the world, its own methods and approaches. It's not, it's not just observing and talking. Um, there's a whole philosophy behind it, um, and, and, and it's important that, you know, as more people engage in qualitative research that we get that right. Um, and finally, uh, one last thing is the sort of the missing role of the global economy in the illegal wildlife trade in our discussions today. It's been touched on several times, um, but the dynamics of the global uh, economy of, you know, where uh, uh, rising forms of wealth or where there's pockets of poverty or systemic poverty, the sort of structural issues around the global economy also need to be addressed because if we understand the way the global economy works and sort of demand and supply and uh, the demand produced by wealth around the world rather than focusing on poverty and the supply side, um, that will also help us perhaps start winning um, in the illegal wildlife trade. As Naomi rightly pointed out, we're probably not winning at the moment. So um, the global economy is something that I think is, is often overlooked but should be kind of central to our thinking. Thanks. Right. Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Bob Smith, I'm um, the Director of DICE, the Durham Institute of Conservation and Ecology at the University of Kent. 
In terms of my background, I definitely feel like I'm a fraud uh, being here. Um, I, was, I lived about 20 miles away from here, and so as soon as I could, uh, um, started doing field work in Africa, in Southern Africa, uh, where I felt the um, wildlife was more charismatic. Sorry, Naomi. Um, and um, sort of through that, through working on projects, um, especially with um, elephants and rhinos, really saw the key role of, of corruption in, in the conservation of those species. Um, so the first bit of work I did on, um, on illegal wildlife trade was based on watching uh, on the TV one of the CITES cops uh, where elephants were in decline um, and it was sort of being treated as if this was an act of God. And having worked in South Africa, which is incredibly successful at conserving um, elephants and rhinos, I thought, I wonder if you plot the change in population of these species against the corruption scores of the countries, whether you find anything. And we found that it was the strongest trend. Um, and uh, so that's sort of beginning, beginnings of my interest in wildlife trade. Another thing I'm interested in is social marketing and behavior change. Uh, and so with the recent focus on, uh, on that uh, for demand reduction um, in the wildlife trade, that's basically why I'm here, but um, I do not have anywhere near as in-depth knowledge of the other people on the platform, so please excuse me. Um, in terms of uh, things that I was really happy to hear about, as I've said, the mention of corruption uh, by um, several people, I think is, um, was really heartening. Um, when we first published uh, that article in 2003, um, it was to sort of general indifference in, in the academic world. Um, and uh, it's been nice to see how uh, that's generally changed. And actually, what's been interesting is it's really the NGOs and around wildlife trade where, to me, corruption has, has risen up the agenda. It was something that used to be ignored for years and years and years, uh, and that's beginning to change. Um, the one thing that I wanted to mention at this point, which is uh, a thing I've always mentioned to people, which is a great paper by Ian Craigie et al., uh, 2010, some of you might know it, uh, that looked at change in um, large mammal populations in African uh, reserves. They had, I think, 60 or 70 different reserves around Africa and looked at the decline, uh, well, the change in population. Um, and what they reported was how uh, those declines were highest in West Africa. There were also declines in East Africa. Um, and in Southern Africa, there were rises. What they didn't really flag up, because I think they ran out of space, was that if you take out the elephant and rhino population data from those studies, there is no difference. Um, so the idea that it's elephants and rhinos that are in particular trouble is, to me, a myth. It's a huge range of, of species. Um, and yeah, when it comes to large mammals, and you know, this includes wildebeest, zebra, things that don't have a high international profile, they're declining just as fast. Um, so I think you know, this, the focus on, on uh, elephants and rhinos, I think, is a, a bit of a red herring. Um, and I think one of the things that people haven't really talked about here today, mostly because we're focusing on demand, but the idea of improving management effectiveness on the ground, um, I feel could solve a lot of the, a lot of the problems um, that aren't really uh, being addressed. The thing that annoyed me, um, and I'm looking up to see whether I get the right response to this, um, is the plant blindness that we found in the room. Sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, the two people I expected to clap. Um, so one of the nice things about being at DICE is that we're interdisciplinary. We welcome anyone, including people who are obsessed with plants. And so I uh, get this a lot. Um, the, uh, the London conference with their beautiful sort of graphics had three species on. Uh, the Kasane conference, I took a photo, has got 23 species. None of those um, were plants. Uh, there was even a baboon in the Kasane um, uh, picture. Um, I would argue that there are lots of, um, lots of plant species that are a higher um, threat from wildlife trade than the Chakma baboon. Um, and uh, also, you know, people were talking about we're trying to stop people from uh, using animals and we're going over to plants instead. You know, because that's, you know, because obviously if people are using plants then that has to be a good thing. Um, that, yeah, I, I hope uh, in the next um, conference uh, um, that's happening in London that there'll be lots of pictures of plants um, as part of the logo. Um, and then, yeah, on to a sort of a broader thing. Uh, so the talks this morning I found really interesting and uh, the, the issues of looking at measuring demand. 
Um, and what struck me, and I think various people mentioned, was how easy it is to measure demand. Um, how you can talk to people about their use of illegal products, how you can go on Facebook and discover people using, um, you know, illegally trading uh, in wildlife, um, which really shows that we're doing a terrible job of enforcement. You know, this is a sign of we're making absolutely no difference. Um, I know, again, from uh, work uh, done at Kent, looking at uh, wildlife trade on the dark web, when... Um, Dave and Julio looked, there's hardly any. That's because you don't need to use the dark web. It's easy. Um, and so again, I mean, I think this really brings home to us that uh, we're really not making much of a difference at the moment. Um, and there are two, two things that come from that. The first is, if we start doing a better job, then the methods that we're using at the moment aren't going to be anywhere near good enough to work out what's going on. So, you know, we're measuring demand in a situation where no one feels that they're um, likely to get into trouble from uh, dealing with, you know, doing something illegal. If that changes, then presumably there will be all these uh, people will go to different platforms, people will do things in much more illicit ways, and so it might be that we need to start looking at methods in the future that will uncover those sorts of things. Um, and the other thing that, that, that comes from that is that it really shows that current resources are woefully inadequate, and as um, both Naomi and Rosalind were saying, just the fact that we are not really focusing at the moment on the majority of wildlife trade. We are looking at a few large, um, very um, popular species. Um, but if you look at the really good talks, you know, we've, we've heard about sharks, we've heard about rosewood, we've heard about a whole set of plants. This really isn't being covered by most of, of what we're looking at at the moment. Um, so, and I strongly doubt that the international community will be interested in funding that. You know, that if we really want to get a handle on um, wildlife trade, we can't rely on the international community. I'm afraid I am now old enough to remember where I'm, I'm on the sort of second cycle. So when I first came into conservation round about 94 was when there was the full-on backlash against enforcement. And enforcement was a completely dirty word for about a decade. Um, and we're now in somewhere where enforcement keeps on being mentioned as the main thing. Demand reduction is coming in a bit, but I fear that we will go start going through those cycles again, um, and you know, because that's how international funding works. And so if we really want to make a difference, we need to move, stop this from being something that's done, as Rosalind says, by outsiders, by foreigners, and it needs to start happening within the country. So you know, again, lots of people have talked about it. But you know, we really need training and capacity within countries. We need the voices of the people who are directly affected to have um, a lot of um, influence on the debate. Um, and then finally, the, the thing that I found really interesting, um, as ever, came from South Africa um, and uh, the lion bone trade, this idea, you know, again, from various people, we heard about unintended consequences. There are all sorts of unintended consequences. Uh, we've heard about changes in the products that are being used, it's, you know, things are changing all the time. Um, and the idea that the precautionary principle is sticking with something that isn't perfect but seems to be working, um, I think is a really powerful idea, um, that we start messing about with things at our peril. Um, and we need, to be, um, yeah, we need to be a lot more cautious when we start doing these things that are often seen as the big ideas. Um, but you know, there are lots of examples of how that leads to all sorts of things that we didn't want. Hi. Um, so, thank you for um, basically leading to uh, my introduction. And um, so, I'm probably the baby in the group. Um, and um, I am, I guess, lucky. Um, and I want to be a lot more optimistic, um, which I think I, I could. Um, I remember when I first started uh, doing. Uh, uh, um, you know, conservation, it was really conservation biology, if most people in the audience actually remember it. Um, over time, and I'm lucky to actually transition, uh, even though it's pretty slow by any standard, um, into what we now call conservation science. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why um, um, I think it's, it's, it's just timely um, for me to actually sort of transition from, you know, being trained as a natural scientist, somebody who actually has a degree in, you know, biology, life sciences, and um, starting to, you know, 
delve more and more into uh, social sciences, and it's really the reason why I decided to um, do fellowships in um, you know, climate change communication. Um, is one of them, uh, or doing some experimental uh, uh, economics, uh, doing intervention program related to conservation work. And this is, this is really sort of I, an eye-opener to me um, uh, to be you know, truly uh, somebody who works on conservation science. And I think the best uh, thing that has happened recently uh, to me is really to be able to have the opportunity to start a program, uh, independent research program in China um, I'm originally from Singapore, um, so I checked the box um, where you know we also eat everything, buy everything, um, and uh, ethnically I'm Chinese. Check, um, you know, moving to China uh, with my family to do research from China uh, using uh, government funded. So check. Um, so, so it's really nice to be here because every every re every presentation here has got. Probably China mentioned in it. So, uh, so come and talk to me. Um, um, so, uh, just just general thoughts on um, what I think um, uh, we should be thinking about. And um, I will add that um, before moving in this position, I was actually in the industry, the private industry that has got nothing to do with conservation because I wanted to sort of step away and you know look at it from the outside. So I was in the education technology uh, sector. Um, what I did was analyze a lot of data, uh, but what I learned was actually a lot um, uh, related to um, business model um, and how the business cycle is really short um, and how you need to sort of get that feedback, which I feel is a little bit lacking uh, in our field. Like, you know, sometimes it takes a while before we actually know whether things work or not, but I think a while is not what we have. You know, the, 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 the cycle should be compressed a lot more like the industry uh, constantly tweaking, right? It's more iterative than anything. So there's, there is no like we, we don't have to wait for something that you know to be perfect before we roll it out. Like if we have the precautionary principle, which you know we feel is going to work, you know let's do that first, and then we just tweak it uh, as we go along. Uh, so that kind of thinking, and then uh, uh, really thinking about how we can scale up efforts. Uh, demand, demand reduction effort is one of them. How do we scale it up? You know. I was listening to this wonderful presentation on Fairwow, uh, you know, uh, the certification scheme. And I was thinking to myself, you know, how many years before, you know, everybody gets that label, right? You know, our our experience with uh, FSC, MSC, you know, is a long process. Uh, can we actually uh, shorten that, right? Can we actually get that to reach as many people as quickly? Uh, so the other thing that I feel is a little bit lacking here is our understanding of uh, our own psychology. Uh, basically, evolutionary psychology is what I'm thinking about. So constantly you keep hearing people talking about, oh, um, at least in the field that I work on, and uh, I'm also interested in thinking really about why is there, why is there this fascination uh, among the human species to collect stuff, to collect rare stuff. You know, that's really what's driving some of the pet trade, which we didn't talk about. Um, so part of my background is that I, I spent you know, a couple of years in Indonesia trying to understand the songbird trade. Um, you know, what is it really that makes them want to actually buy you know, wild birds as opposed to farm birds, right? And also there's this rarity component in that. So, so there are some things we already know. We already know that the human species like to collect stuff. You know, we like to hoard. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we, we need to sort of understand from an evolutionary perspective, which I think would be helpful in terms of designing uh, behavioral change uh, campaign. You know, things that we know, like we have so much very rich information about that aspect of us, which I feel that, you know, it's already there. Uh, the other thing is uh, there's a lot of expertise in the business sector, the business school, the marketing program especially. You know, that's how I also learned a lot, you know, talking to my friend who's a marketing professor and, you know, telling me about, you know, product diffusion, you know, all those theory model diffusion. And basically what it just means is that, you know, how you basically spread the word. How does a product, in this case, how do we make people, you know, want to buy a certain product? You know, be it a certified product or not, you know, things like that. And how does it diffuse across the network? So we need to understand that a bit more. And, you know, you start, and, and I'm glad that we are bringing a lot more computer science expertise because, you know, there's a lot of data out there. Because we are so much more connected to technology uh, to social media, uh, there is obviously pros and cons, but then there is an, an, an opportunity there to sort of leverage that 
uh, that uh, I wouldn't call it addiction yet, but um, you know that that uh, fascination, just staying in touch um, with this network, um, and you know how to again leverage that to spread the word. Um, so it's conservation marketing, social marketing, whatever you call it, it is marketing. Uh, it's just a different product at the end. Um, so having that, a having a little bit more of those business thinking, I think, um, um, could help. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, I'm able to gain that experience and then coming in with, I, I guess, a slightly different kind of angle. Um, and, um, um, but um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, that there is a lot uh, that everybody could contribute and, and we should start bringing uh, different perspective, uh, different players, different stakeholders onto the table and into a symposium like this um, so that, you know, every voice is heard um, as opposed to, you know, constantly, uh, you know, siloing, which we have done in the last probably 30 years, um, 20, 25, 30 years, give and take. But, um, you know, I see progress, but I think we need to, uh, quicken that process. Thank you. Should we give a clap to our four um, panelists? <laughs> okay, so here's the plan. I think we want to try and get as much discussion going and, as, and everybody else has got their own insights about things that annoyed them and things that inspired them and things that intrigued them. So I think what we'll do is uh, take a few people from the audience to uh, give their short questions, insights, and so on, and then we'll, we'll revert back to the panelists, um, particularly if you've got something specific that you'd like to ask uh, people to follow up from what they've said. So, Tim, do you want to take that? Has anyone got anything they'd like to say so far? Over there, and then you. Hi, uh, my name is Fiona Pamplin. Uh, just a quick background to myself. I started out in the, in the private sector as a commercial marketeer, working for big bad boys like Unilever. And I worked for Population Services International in behavior change communications um, on a big USAID funded program, uh, HIV, and HIV AIDS prevention. And then I changed career and came into conservation, so I retrained as a scientist. So I'm a bit of a hybrid, a bit of a mule, as I was trying to explain to somebody. Um, so I kind of see things from quite a few different perspectives, which is very interesting and enlightening. Um, I also was a little bit disappointed not to see more representation of what can be achieved through social marketing. Um, and in fact, one of the people I was talking to during the break actually said, I don't even really know what social marketing is. So I think there's opportunity really to continue to enlighten the audience and participation participators in demand reduction in the tools and concepts surrounding social marketing techniques and what can be achieved. Um, working in HIV AIDS prevention, it was very, very similar uh, characteristics in terms of sensitivity of subject, taboos, changing social norms. All of the ingredients are there and all of the tools are there as well. I mean, just skimming through some of the websites before I came to this conference, because to be honest, I'm very kind of illiterate also on the detail of wildlife trade. So I was doing some sort of general searches and the, there's so much information out there, already, you know, research mythologies that have been developed by social marketing organizations, tools that have been developed, and all of this stuff can be easily adapted to the context of the illegal wildlife trade. So, I, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. It's, most of it's out there. It needs to be sort of sought, sought after and adapted. Um, and the second point I just wanted to make was to reiterate the point about capacity building. Um, I've worked in, cons in the conservation sector for about seven years and, and also worked a lot in Africa in both HIV AIDS and in conservation. And I think one of the most important functions of you know, Westerners coming in is, is capacity building, whether that's in um, capacity building with wildlife patrols and you know, the whole um, policing, but also capacity building in terms of building social marketing expertise and research expertise in country with locals so that, so that the countries take control. It's empowering the countries to deliver on their 
you know, on saving their own environments and climate change and species and whatever. So I think capacity building is a very important element of any intervention program and, and transfer, you know, knowledge and skills transfer to the, the countries and the environments that we're hoping to or trying to um, assist. Thank you. Great, thank you. We're going to take a few. Um, can everyone be as short as possible so that we can get as many people in as possible? I'll try and be as short as possible. First of all, I don't want to cause any offence at all. Uh, I'm a bit of a mongrel. I shouldn't really be here because of my background is both military and in the oil and gas game. Um, <laughs> I'm rather, Naomi, um, I'm rather like you. Um, I'm uh, saddened by what I see, and I see a lot of stuff on the ground. And we work with Northern Rangelands Trust, in particular in Kenya. And um, one thing that really hasn't come out is community. It has in, in, in bits. But community, resilience, empowerment, education is hugely important in my view because um, all the good stuff that is happening um, is undermined if the community itself uh, is not functioning as indeed uh, endangering wildlife. And we see that very clearly in NRT, um, although uh, in terms of, for instance, cattle uh, and NRT trading, it's made a hell of a difference to grazing, and that has made a terrific difference um, to wildlife conservation. And an elephant, rhino, or any other exotic um, is worth a huge amount more alive to the community than it is dead. So, um, it's on that score that uh, I think that um, we're between the devil and the deep blue sea. Because in Africa, um, again, working for an oil company, um, they were bought off. And that didn't actually help. And we never really got to the, the bottom of the problem in terms of education, empowerment, and employment. To a degree, the NRT model is doing that. And a lot of the stuff that I've been hearing about today will also help tremendously in that regard. But it then comes down to the top level, which is corruption. And um, within these four walls, the corruption that I've seen at presidential, uh, ministerial level in many countries in Africa defies description. Uh, is it getting any better? No, it's not. Um, so when government doesn't actually support the community, when government, whether it be at the national or state level, um, uses the community to their own end, uh, coupled with natural disaster like we are having with a drought in Kenya at the moment, the result is that wildlife does suffer. And I think that my sort of major point here is that um, all the stuff that is going on, and really good stuff that is going on, it needs to be coordinated better. Uh, and an executive arm targeted at the problem, whatever that may be, whether it be Pacific, regional, or whatever, is certainly going to be a way forward. Uh, sharing information, collaboration, which is very difficult, I know, but again, um, it's something which I think bears thought. But uh, the communities at the moment, um, they are losing the battle. Let's be absolutely clear about that. And I very much back up what Naomi has to say. Is there anyone on the panel who, yeah, is there anyone on the panel who'd like to respond to either of those two comments briefly? Or shall we move on to some more? Well, so I, I suppose I wanted to take up the, this question of the value of wildlife. Um, you know, but when we say that the value, the value of wildlife or the value of an elephant to a community is a greater alive than dead, um, do we mean the economic value, um, the cultural value, the value in relation to the potential value of cattle, the cult cultural value of cattle. I think value is a, is a very loaded term and it's one of those ones that social scientists will spend books, theses, years of their lives unpacking. So when we say value, I think we need to be very specific. And certainly in the context of some countries um, and, and now parts of Kenya, I'm sure, economic value as a, a, a sort of a tourist attraction and rev revenue generating a source of revenue generation um, for a safari industry is 
you know, that's in decline or is, is not going to produce the sorts of economic value that people imagine it would. And even if it did, there's no guarantee that that funds would get to local communities that, you know, there's a very long history of uh, safari tourism, um, uh, the, the, the monies from safari tourism going to external companies or going to elites rather than to local communities. So I think we do need to be careful about this question of value, but I appreciate what you're saying. Um, yes, just as a adding on to what Rosalind said, we're um, doing work in the Transmara next to the Masai Mara National Nature Reserve where poaching is beginning to be under control and so people are now killing elephants in retribution for human wildlife conflict. So you know, ele elephant numbers keep on going down um, and you know, those people, for however you want to define it, are not valuing elephants. Um, so you know, they want to kill those elephants. Uh, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to, I mean, I guess to, just to hop back on my first point a little bit and to, to try and bring it back to demand, but also, I mean, I, I take a little bit of issue with the assumption that capacity building it, it, um, belongs, the, the, the responsibility for capacity, capacity building belongs in this sector, which echoes what Rosie said. I think we have to be very, very careful about that. Some of the best trained rangers I know are African, black Africans. They don't need someone coming in to train them on how to protect their wildlife. In fact, these days they're going out to the rest of the world to teach, to teach the rest of the world how to do it. And I think, you know, again, I'd say actually the people who need capacity building are us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just, I have a real dislike for that term almost that's been built up over time and time again of organisations going in, whether they're NGOs or academics, saying, well, we're going to build capacity for these people. I mean, I would find that insulting. <laughs> and, and I just think we need to be very careful about that. I think we need to start off by saying, actually, we need the capacity building. Because you're absolutely right. When we, when we started behaviour change campaigns in Vietnam, as an example, PSI was the organisation we went to for help. Because we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> so so the, the very first step is to stick your hand up and say, I, we don't know this, we're conservationists, we're project managers, we're all kinds of things. We need the capacity building. And I would say rangers could teach us all a, a thing or two. So, so it's almost about flipping it on its head. And I think we throw that term out way too frequently and way too easily, um, sitting in workshops and conferences and in project plans, saying we're going to run capacity building. I, I mean, I've been on both sides and I've seen it. So I, I just think we need to be very specific and clear and, and the very first step should be us saying, actually, we don't actually know what we're doing <laughs> and we need the training. Great. OK, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the coffee break or in, in the wine afterwards. So we've got three more people who are going to say something briefly, all three of them. I'll keep it brief. Yeah. Um, the big thing I learned in behaviour change was that positive messaging is really powerful. And maybe we should try this a little bit on ourselves because um, obviously it's fair, we all know there's still a lot to do, but I do think rather than us all continuously, and I think everyone here is aware that we're not achieving what we're trying to achieve, but saying we're failing, saying with this, I think the, it's an immense challenge that we're trying to do. And what I get impressed by the presentation this morning is how much is achieved on so little. I mean, if you want to take funding in the UK, 95% of funding goes to human charities. 2.5% goes to animal welfare. 2.5% of all fundraising goes to conservation of the entire planet. That's how little resources we are working with. And everyone I know here is pretty much over capacity and doing a lot. So I think it's great to think about and identify what we could do more of. But there was a great conference earlier this year called the Optimism Conference. I do think we need a little bit more of that because we need to motivate ourselves and become better community ourselves. And that's what I think this conference is doing really well at, is how do we as a community work better? How do we bring people into that community? And how do we feel positive and optimistic that we're actually trying to achieve an immense thing that we're trying to set out to do? Right. Um, so, yes, so thank you very much for, for very insightful uh, presentations. I get, um, my, my point is around the need for tinkering. 
And I think it's really important that we uh, experiment. Um, I feel one big obstacle is that tinkering and the usefulness of tinkering is related to our ability to determine what works and what doesn't. And I, I see really two big barriers there. One of them is that we don't, we don't really have a history of evaluating our work very well. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty important. Very often we, we, we talk as if we have a sense of what works or what doesn't, particularly around behavior change, for example. But I feel like in reality, if we start digging down and really understanding what, what data is available, what evidence is that out there available, um, we often come out empty-handed almost, I would say. Uh, and that's a big challenge. Um, the other one is celebrating failure. I feel like there's, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of conversations around success and how important it is, and certainly is important, but wouldn't it be great if we could just also share the failures, the things that didn't work out as well, um, so we can ma maximize that learning, so we can all learn from each other's mistakes um, and avoid duplication and uh, wasting time and money. Thank you. I uh, my name is Grace Gabriel. I'm um, uh, for inter I work for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. I'm like Tianming Li. I check all the boxes. I'm Chinese, and, <laughs> um, and I I just feel that uh, quite often all of the presentations today touch upon chi China and Chinese. The demand is from China, but I I I think we're missing a big point, which is um, um, because I'm Chinese, I actually, I am a believer of traditional Chinese medicine. I use Chinese medicine, but I'm also a conservationist. So I, I feel that only 3% of the ingredients used in traditional medicine come from animal parts. And also in, in uh, the reason I use traditional Chinese medicine are because, number one, as Li Xin said, traditional Chinese medicine is achieving balance in one's body. It's preventative, it's taking a precautionary principle rather than wait till it's sick, a person's sick, and then treat it. Another reason I believe in traditional medicine is um, because it treats the roots of the problem rather than the symptoms. Um, I, I feel as a conservationist, there are a lot we can learn from traditional Chinese medicine. And not only learning from it, you know, for instance, when we talk about replacing rhino horn, and we replace it with what? With saiga antelope horn. And then that caused saiga population to collapse. So I feel that you know, these things, we shouldn't look at T TCM as the problem. There are a lot of things we can learn from. Okay, so, um, Jianming, do you want to start? <laughs> um, disclosure, I work with Grace. Um, so, um, I think Grace brought up a, a, a very important point, and, um, you know, what I think um, it's, it's interesting based on today's presentation is the idea of um, um, what is that word? Um, sorry, unintended consequences. Um, I think we need to do a better job um, in trying to at least assign some probability on what happens if we remove rhino horn. You know. Could we have predicted that we would have gone after, people would have gone after Sega horns? If not, what else? So I think we need to sort of think about um, what um, I think I'm also hearing a little bit now about scenario planning. Um, you know, the, the, the people working on the climate change issue uh, has been you know, thinking about scenarios for the longest time, uh, different models predicting different scenarios. So, so, um, you know, at least for the wildlife trade, you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, if we, if we have certain action plan, certain policy to ban certain products, what is the consequences for that? We should be able to know, at least with some level of certainty or uncertainty, you know, depending on how you look at it. Um, so, um, so that, that should be uh, in a predictive framework. Um, like, we have uh, some P 
people highlighting, um, I think the, the, the rosewood and the hongmu is a good example. Um, what happens if you, you know, ban, ho ban redwood? Well, let's look for something that looks like it, you know, something that they can work on. Um, so that's how, that, that is, makes sense. You know, looking back now on high side, you, it makes sense. They are going after, you know, something similar. Um, so, uh, so I feel that we can grow in that aspect. Um, and we definitely have the capability to actually do better in that sense, so. Okay, should we get one or two more? Or has anyone got a burning thing to say over here? No, we'll get one or two more and then we have to finish. So there's one right at the back there. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Holly again. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tanya White at Northumbria University. I just point out that when we are con Constructing these uh, demand reduction programs, we shouldn't forget about the EU and the US, which are huge areas, and also not to forget Latin America. I know I have a project there, they tend to feel very overlooked, and I think particularly with hurricanes and earthquakes and things, they could use a lot of support. I think you get the mic, Holly. Oh, Hunter wants to talk, let's have Hunter. This is, ooh, this is a question for you, uh, Tian Ming. Uh, you mentioned that we need to be kind of engaging with different partnerships and looking at things like evolutionary biology uh, to bring into these demand reduction campaigns or whatever else type conservation work efforts we're putting into place. But when we have such cultural differences also kind of playing in, how do you, wh what do you recommend for us to do as Westerners to get this information coming from, not from our evolutionary biologists or our cultural anthropologists, but from Asian cultural anthropologists or Asian evolutionary biologists. Because, you know, in my work, we've been trying to reach out with different partnerships. And some are successful and some haven't been. So what's the best approach from that perspective to make successful partnerships? Okay, so I think, um, I think the specific question can be left for the drinks, but I think we can have a general question about cultural difference that everybody can talk to, and about how uh, people sitting here in the UK, uh, what's our role? Do we have one? Who wants to go first on that one? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we have to think about um, whether the community or, you know, whichever area you're interested in working with, whether the people are ready for whatever you're trying to do. Um, just give you a quick example. Um, I just went back to southern China recently, and um, what I've been seeing and hearing is that there is now a demand for organic food a lot. Um, so then the question is, how did that happen, you know? And, and I think one of the answer um, people have been telling me is that, you know, there is a lot of interest now. Well, people are concerned about food safety issue, right? So naturally, they gravitate towards that. So yeah, you know, I want my food now to be safe. So, so you know now that there is a market there, right? Market, you know, it has, has to have some kind of business so that people would uh, be, be you know, be concerned about. The people are thinking about it. That, that's when it's much easier to actually, you know, make changes because people are ready for it, right? So if we're trying to force an idea that's sort of foreign to them, not natural to them, they would push back, right? Unless, of course, you know, they have funding to sustain them for three to five years. As, you know, many of us have, you know, experience. After that, what happens? They just go back to what they're used to. Funding ends, you know, let's just revert to, you know, our natural behavior. Okay, so anybody else want to answer my question? Um, yes, I mean, I would say that if you want to annoy people, then get some foreigners to lecture them about stuff. <laughs> um, and you know, at the moment, most of the international wildlife trade debate is based on that. Um, I've been very fortunate in my career to work a lot in South Africa. Uh, most of my work is on identifying priority areas for conservation. In the last two years, I've started working with Natural England to teach them the things that, I, that South Africans taught me over the last 20 years. So the UK is going to soon be about 15 years behind South Africa uh, instead of the 2025 that it has been for a very long time. Um, so, I mean, you know, in terms of this capacity building, I, you know, I agree entirely. Um, and one of the things that makes me shout at the TV is 
when countries that are successfully conserving the species of interest are told, you know, we're not interested in what you have to say, stop being selfish and think about the world, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, more broadly, uh, a lot of what I do is quite techy, and I see my role as uh, I have developed different bits of software to make conservationists' lives easier around the world. So, you know, that's, that's how I see my main role for capacity building is to um, make life easier for lots of people who are actually, you know, who are doing things on the ground. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to um, reiterate and applaud Tanya Wyatt's point that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about China and traditional Chinese medicine, but we need to, we shouldn't overlook the role of the US and the European Union in terms of being major uh, places for demand and for supply um, as well. Um, and certainly I also <laughs> get irritated by capacity building and I think uh, rather like education, capacity building needs to work um, both ways and it should be about an exchange and about a learning process and not about a certain group of people telling everybody else how it should be. Um, but there should be more of that kind of to and fro uh, between different groupings of people. So, so if I understand your question correctly, um, it was about how we deal with cultural differences. I think there were two. There was that and then what can And then what's the role that, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think um, having lived in lots of countries in Asia, in Africa, currently live in a foreign country, I spend a lot of time trying to understand cultural differences and being sensitive to them, less so here than in other locations, perhaps. <laughs> And I'm not going to claim that I've been successful in any of them, to be honest, but I think that, I mean, for me, that's, you know, recognise that um, there are those cultural differences, that at activities that we undertake, whether they're about changing, you know, behaviour change campaigns or anything else, or even just visiting and trying to understand the, the conservation landscape in those areas, it's about trying to put them into the cultural context in, in which they're in. A, and obviously, unless you're in that culture, um, of that culture, it can be very difficult. So I think just doing, you know, doing your very best to recognise those differences and, and learn from them and accommodate them and be sensitive to them. Again, I, I'm the first one to say I'm not always successful at being sensitive to them. Um, in terms of sitting here or any, any of those other locations, for me, I think the best thing we can do is, is recognise that albeit there are cultural differences between countries and obviously political ones. In increasingly, we're living in a world where those things don't matter as much. International trade, online trade, you know, the, the ease of travel, the ease of moving things around the world, you know, and recognising that we do all live in a, in a global world and we're all part of this problem, you know, because the UK, the US, the, you know, South America, Australia, Asia, wherever you live, wildlife trade and illegal wildlife trade touches all of our lives. So recognising that um, beyond conservationists, we're all part of the problem as much as we're all part of the solution and we are working towards the solution. We've just got a long way to go. Great, okay, so it's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much for all the contributions from the floor. And can we just show our appreciation again to our insightful panelists?